Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Sorry if the lighting is a little bit weird right now. I am recording at night. Reasoning being that I procrastinated too long due to looking at my fantasy football team and trying to make trades and then I had to roster bait right after that. So anyways, now that I've completed, let's go ahead and get into some systems design for the day. We will be talking about Redis and Memcached. All right, so before we jump into this one, let's just do a very quick refresher on some certain types of caching that we've seen throughout computing. The most obvious one is probably the one that comes with your CPU, and that would be things like L1, L2, and L3 cache. You've also just got individual device cache. A good example of this would be an app on your mobile phone. For example, with Google Drive, typically you'll download a copy of the thing that you're storing in the cloud so that if you don't have access to internet, you can go ahead and access it locally. Another thing would be an example of caching on your application server. So if we have a server right here, and we've got a database right there, maybe we'll actually go ahead and save some of the results from our database in the cache, so that if the user ever goes ahead and requests them again, we can just quickly return it from our server. However, this comes with a problem. Like we've spoken about in the past, when your cache is actually tied to a physical device or something like that, it is literally limited by the capacity of the device itself. And so as a result, sometimes we want our own separate caching layer. And in distributed computing, the way we might do this is with something like Redis or Memcached. So what are the upsides and downsides to recap? Well, basically, it is a little bit more complex because now you might have to add and manage separate components. But at the same time, and this is the most important part, it scales independently. So if we need a ton of cache because most of our requests are basically the same, and we really don't need much computing power on our servers, we can have a ton of cache and only one server and one database node. At the same time, if we need a ton of databases but very little cache, well, we can do that too. So let's go ahead and talk about data storage. Do, 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 do as I zoom in. And basically, one thing about caches is that, you know, typically we want them to offer us some sort of performance boost. And there are a couple of ways that you can do this. One is when the data itself is being stored somewhere physically closer to the user. A good example of that would be the Google Drive example, uh, where, you know, for example, you would write to a document and then eventually that gets uploaded to a cloud, but that's done asynchronously and the write to your local hard drive is basically a write back cache and it's faster because it is located closer in proximity to your device. But if that makes a little bit less sense, the point is some caches are closer to you and some caches are literally just faster by storage. And that is going to be the case for Redis and Memcache. The reasoning why is that they both store data in memory. And so we've seen a couple of in-memory storage systems so far on this channel. And the one that I've spoken about the most in this series would be VoltDB. So if you haven't watched the VoltDB video, it's not too important for this one, but the gist is that is effectively also an in-memory storage, but it's also a relational database. And so that comes with a lot of guarantees that we don't necessarily need here, because for our cache, what we really care more so about is just having a key value store. And so it is going to be non-relational. That's going to be the case for both Redis and Memcached. So let's start by talking about Memcached first, because it's a little bit more basic, and then Redis kind of builds on top of it. So Memcache is a super bare bones in memory store, and we can go ahead and scale this thing out by having a bunch of nodes, making it distributed, all that fun stuff. So if we do make it distributed, obviously we want some sort of partitioning, right? Fortunately, Memcache does support that for us out of the box using a consistent hash ring. So as we have right here in my little diagram, basically everything in this range, for example, on the like consistent hashing ring, if this was like keys A, through J or something would be stored from uh, on node one. And then the same thing over here, all gonna be stored on node two, and then the same thing over here, all gonna be stored on node three. Now using consistent hashing is super useful because it means that the same requests are going to be getting routed to the same cache, hence the same data will be going to the same users. So for example, if I want my Facebook profile cached, it's probably going to be good that I'm getting sent to the right cache every single time where my data actually lives. So that's useful. Then we've also got multi-threading. Now, in theory, you would think, well, that's not that big of a deal. Pretty much every database has multi-threading. Well, guess what? Maybe Redis doesn't, so we'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, just as a quick throwback to last video, it also does use a least recently used eviction policy. So how do we implement that? Let's remember, doubly linked list with a hash map. The reason being that Let's say this is the head of the list, 
This is the tail. We evict from the tail. If I were to go ahead and read this node right here, then the fact that I have this hash map allows me to figure out where it is and then move it back around to the head. Anyways, that's a bit of a tangent. Now let's go ahead and move on to Redis and talk about that a little bit. So the main benefit that Redis offers over Memcached is that it's super feature rich. As opposed to just being like a very simple in-memory key value store, you can use hash maps, you can use sorted sets, you can even use geo indexes, and all of those are implemented in memory, which is really great. So as opposed to memcached, which just does partitioning via consistent hashing and having a variable number of partitions, in the case of Redis, we actually have a fixed number of partitions, and which partition goes where is basically communicated via a gossip protocol. So let's imagine every single one of these guys has three partitions on it, so there are 12 fixed partitions in the system. If this guy were to go down, then you'll see that we're going to move one of its partitions to every single one of the nodes. And we can do that because basically these guys are going to say, oh, is this thing down? I think so. Is this thing down? I think so. And then once they all agree, then partitions start getting moved around. Okay, cool. Another useful thing that we've got with Redis is a write-ahead log. So I didn't mention that in memcached, but of course what that write-ahead log is going to allow us to do is make atomic operations because we can first commit them to the write-ahead log and then we can actually write them in memory. That way, if our machine were to go down in the middle of it, we can look at our write-ahead log and say, well, were we supposed to actually write this thing? If not, well, abort it. If so, commit it. And so that way we can have atomic uh, basically operations. The next thing that is important to ensure ACID transactions, which we can do in Redis, is ensuring isolation. So how does Redis do that? Well, it actually just runs things single-threadedly. And so what we end up doing is achieving actual serial execution, kind of similar to VoltDB, actually. So again, this allows us to have actual transactions in Redis, which can be really useful if you want those type of data guarantees. I'm not saying it's impossible with memcached either, it's just that you're probably going to have to implement that type of locking yourself. Then finally, Redis, while it is feature rich, also kind of forces you to use single leader replication. It's good because it kind of configures that out of the box for you, but at the same time, now you're stuck to that paradigm. So, as a quick conclusion before I get ready to go to sleep, Distributed caches, like I mentioned, are really great because you can scale them independently. You can have as much or as little capacity as you really need, and Redis and Memcached are two really good solutions for achieving that goal. That being said, they do differ slightly. I think Redis is a little bit more of a managed solution. If you're a solo developer or something and you just need something to hold you over, I feel like Redis is probably going to make your life easier. That being said, if you need some super complex caching setup, you have the developers and you know the complexity is required, well, maybe you might actually need multi-leader, leaderless replication. Maybe you do need some sort of special type of locking. And as a result, maybe memcache might be the better option for you. So while it does offer a little bit more flexibility, in my opinion, it seems to be a little bit less convenient. So I'd say that's probably the main trade-off there. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm looking forward to doing the interviews.